Salutations, everyone. Welcome back to Total War Pharaoh. I am Lord Ferrand, and today we're going to be going over the Hittite King's faction. Uh, I'm going to make one attempt at this guy's name, Supiliyama. Uh, they say it in the game. I still can't learn how to say it. Um, he's the, the king of the Hatti, the great king. He's the only character that starts as a ruler, and he actually starts with... Um, uh, a lot of land. He kind of feels like a ruler. I think he should deserve more land, but he's a very fun uh, start, very hard start. So this video is going to be divided into various sections. I will timestamp below so you can jump to what you'd like. Uh, if the video does help you, um, please do leave a like, comment, or subscribe. And I uh, hope you enjoyed the video. Let's jump right into it. Okay, so conceptually, this faction is supposed to be designed as you're surrounded by enemies. You kind of are, but there are strategies to overcome them. So let's go over his actual strengths and weaknesses, and then we will go over his start. So the big thing is happiness is not really an issue for this faction. You have refugee centers, which will give you some food and happiness. You have garrison quarters, which give you happiness. Um, overall, very good buildings, and you have militia gathering posts, which will reduce upkeep, give morale and defense for the army. Once you take land, throwing some of those down will help you maintain control of the region. I don't think I lost a settlement I had a garrison in, in my playthroughs as this guy. Um, he's very good at defending. And that goes right along with his faction units. He has Hattusin Axemen. Um, axes to break through shields and armor as well as chariots overall he's got access to good units that mainly cost food although his late units that actually cost bronze and gold are even stronger in terms of his commands which help uh you can command your faction to improve replenishment of your armies you do have to use encampment stance the game does remind you here but this helps a lot, especially as the land slips into crisis and then even if it falls into collapse. Very few factions can maintain replenishment. You can use this and you will get more replenishment. It's not abnormal to replenish half or more of your army in like two to three turns. Um, I never had any issue with replenishment, but that's because after playing Total War Hammer, uh, I got very into taking replenishment wherever possible. I still recommend that, although with this guy you could justifiably take like upkeep, upkeep or movement and just use this command. The problem is not using it on Shemsu Hor, you get increased workforce. This means you can build up your settlements even faster than other factions. You still need the resources, which is a bit of an issue at the beginning, but once you get going and you start conquering lands or even vassalizing them, you'll have plenty of resources. Um, I think I maxed out my capital settlement, all the buildings upgraded and fully built by like turn 40 or something. And then I had just excess resources because I hadn't expanded much. You want to expand, uh, but the workforce will help you build up as well. In terms of your court, um, you're the great king of Hati, which is a big help. It means you're going to be fending off people for the throne rather than trying to take it yourself. It's much easier to hold the throne than it is to take it. Um, you get twice as much regard from gossip, encourage, and discourage intrigues. Um, when a position is occupied by a new character, you gain regard from them to get requests. I tended to use it more to uh, uh, discredit them and steal legitimacy. You want to be continuously stealing legitimacy from people, but the ability to get requests can be helpful at times. The other thing that's important to realize is because you're great king, the game, I don't know if it's a bug or it doesn't tell you this, you can fill two slots of the court with your people, and as you build up more, it's worth taking the increasing powers um, or the court control as you grow, and you can occupy more and more and more of the court slots. Um, that will prevent other people from gaining access to the abilities, uh, and you'll really have to just fend off control of your ruler. For some reason, your subordinates don't tend to have legitimacy, which is nice. Overall, great at manipulating the court. Starting as the Great King is really nice. 
In terms of his outpost, he starts off with really good religion here. Arena gives you basically recruitment decrease as well as happiness. Any god that gives you happiness is nice. Less for this guy, but is still really strong. Uh, don't forget forts. This guy, since he's surrounded by lots of factions, unless you're going to be conquering them all, using the forts to reduce upkeep combined with um, your outposts, or sorry, your actual buildings here, like your garrison quarters and militia posts, you can decrease the upkeep in the forts even lower. Um, it's really nice. You do. It does remind you you start with a landmark here. Don't really think about it. It's not worth worrying about. In terms of titles, your titles you'll get give defensive replenishment, helping you defend better. The reality is defense and replenishment also help you go on offense better, which is quite fun. And you don't have to worry as much about legitimacy because you, legitimacy because you're in charge. But as the game goes on, obviously you need to keep expanding your, your legitimacy. I never had anybody able to pass me in legitimacy. In fact, I've got a strategy, kind of, I'll explain later, which should potentially prevent you from even falling into a civil war. Um, I'll tell you about it. It may work, it may not for you. In terms of your ancient legacy, you basically have two to pick from. They do recommend you go the Building the Vassal's Gratitude, Mutawali or Tali or something, the Benevolent. That's the better one in my experience for this guy. More resources from people and better yet, you can use it to gain other stuff. But I'll go over that later. In terms of his starting location, you start off with a good start. You have most of a region. You're going to want to take this reasonably early on to fill it out. You have access to stone, which is really good. You have access to wood, also helpful. The problem is, despite your capital being a food production region, your food production is relatively low. Um, you're not on a river. As you can see, it's a bit of an arid landscape. Anatolia, modern day Turkey, is not known for its lush and fertile uh, rivers and farms, especially at this point in history. So you start off with the capital of Hattusa. Um, fascinating, read about its history and stuff. The Hittites are becoming better known as time goes on. They were a major civilization, and they actually left written records. So uh, if you're interested, definitely worth checking out some stuff about their writing and stuff. Quite cool. Now, in your capital region, you do have access to the royal legal complex, as well as your translator's quarters, um, both of which are extremely important for you. But let's go over actual moves now, and I'll do buildings later. Sorry, I'm getting distracted. There's a lot here. This guy's a fun start. So your ruler himself, he gets plus four replenishment while encamped. That can build up to 15. Really quite useful, especially as game goes on and replenishment gets lower. Now, the, tick, the trick to trying to prevent a civil war is right here with this golden spear, the great king. It's not the weapon you want equipped. You want to equip, click on it, and you want to swap to the Celestial Axe. The reason is the second ability there. Plus five diplomatic relations with Hittites, factions wide, available to the sitting Great King. Really useful, improving your relationships with the Hittites. Um, considering these are going to be your main rivals and these people tend to attack you, any reduction that keeps them happy is really good like these guys they have a faction aversion of negative five just from the start throwing on that weapon brings it to zero meaning they are much less likely to declare war on you in fact with a little bit of effort and a couple turns you can get non-aggression packs with most of the hittite factions some will still attack you but it's much easier to fight a one or two fronted war than like a five fronted war so let's go over starting stuff. So you want to take out this army, is which is really easy. I kind of would recommend personally commanding one of these two first fights, though. Otherwise, you will probably lose your chariot. Um, you can take out these guys, immediately march over, take out these guys. But in my experience, you will lose this chariot uh, unless you fight yourself. Now, is that a bad thing? Not necessarily. You have no copper. Well, you start off with the default copper. 
Um, but get it. Oh, sorry. Bronze. Why do I keep bronze? This brown metal. Um, getting more bronze is a little bit tricky for this faction. Most of the people you're going to be fighting don't have access to bronze. Um, this is the closest bronze settlement. And if you can, it's worth taking, but might not be the most optimal uh, path of expansion. But outside of that, if you look around, these are all gold, stone, and food, gold, stone, wood, food, stuff like that. There's some copper down here, but it's a ways away. Copper is your major issue. There's some over there. You're going to want to get this province if you can. If you can't, you're going to have to make do with non-elite units. So losing a chariot, losing 30 bronze is fine because you may not be able to upkeep it long anyway. Uh, I think you start off with a basic amount of income in every resource except for stone just starting the game. So this will change as time goes on. Once you've taken this out, you have a couple options. One, you can sit back and build up, which is not a bad move because in my experience, either these guys over here whatever these guys are, and Syra, or these guys will tend to declare war on you early on. You can preempt this by invading and taking Evrina, which would unite your region. The downside is you'll be at war with these guys, and either of these two factions may declare war on you. These guys will join the civil war at some point in my experience, but they don't tend to attack you. You do start with a vassal down here, which is nice, except for the fact that factions can declare war on the vassal and then you have to defend them. These guys are good. They have a copper mine, uh, which is nice, except that it's not yours. You get a little bit from sometimes from them as gifts or through diplomacy, but I wouldn't rely on it. These guys, however, though, if you go to war with these factions down here, they will conquer them in my experience. I had th this vassal alone conquered this area by like turn 60 or 70 without any of my help it was they're a good vassal they will handle a lot of problems you want to keep them happy basically um i kind of recommend taking arena and then trying to push over this way if you can take this settlement here and this settlement you will have enough food to really support a full army without going into debt as well as two stone mines to build up as well as gold Taking this settlement, though, is rather difficult in my experience because it's a capital one and they usually have a decent sized army. Ambushing here, luring them out, taking them out, then counterattacking is good. The other thing is you could just vassalize them. Once you control this area, they're going to be weak, pathetic. Having them join will help with uh, the keep your vassals happy legacy type thing. On the other hand, they tend to succeed a lot. Basically, conquer this area is your first move. The other option is you ignore this, which prevents you from uniting the region, which may be problematic, and go after these guys. Um, these guys, in my experience, always attack you. I have not been able to keep them happy with me through diplomacy basically ever. If you look at that, they have a past war. They hate you. It's only to get worse. That bonus does not solve the problem. Um, taking them out rather than starting another war might be a good idea. Give you some more food and would unfortunately it's not a full region either to get the full region you're gonna have to pick a fight with these guys now this is a safer expansion route in some ways i found these guys to be rather weak and easy to conquer if left alone though they become a powerhouse with five settlements they will start invading other areas and conquering them plus it gets you access to copper some more stone and food limiting these guys probably the best strategy but it depends if these guys attack you these guys or these guys first if these guys are smart enough or dumb enough to attack you just take them out they're really easy to overrun once you've cemented your area then it becomes a matter of fending off challengers to the throne don't forget that you can you will get legitimacy from your buildings here they're not amazing but they're decent the big way you're going to get more legitimacy though is by building Hittite monuments. So, really good to build. You have access to stone, so it can be worth throwing that one down pretty much on turn one. Um, be aware, though, that if you don't take out these two armies in like the first couple turns, they tend to sack this Hittite rock sanctuary settlement here, or outpost, which hurts your legitimacy and tends to kick off the war. So trying to prevent that, really good move. On the other hand, 
you already have a Hittite monument in that area. So you need access to more provinces, which is why conquering this area, getting access to another one, as well as these, can really help on the legitimacy front. Um, and we'll go over buildings more. Uh, let's move on to royal decrees. So the Hittite tree of tech tree or royal decree tree is slightly different than the Egyptians. Um, it's important to notice the differences because most people have played the Egyptians and have done guides on the Egyptians. So some of the biggest differences here is the plus one influence for the Egyptian is now plus three workforce growth, which changes your start. Yes, getting happiness is good, but the reality is workforce growth is invaluable for building up. And as a defensive faction, building up is kind of the name of the game. Snagging this for your first tech, followed by happiness, which is always good, followed by food, relations, and more food. Now, sometimes I say diverge into stone. Don't do it on this faction. Get the food. Food is your biggest obstacle for quite some time. Stone is great. Not going to be game changing. Now, over here, if you're Egyptian, you get 10. If you're Canaanite, you get 10. But we get plus 10 with the Hittites. The sooner we can get here, the better. In fact, you could justifiably ignore this if you're going to just beeline straight here. Uh, if you do, this is really nice. 9, 13, 13 plus 5 should stop the Civil War at that point. If you can get to an additional plus 10, you can pretty much rest assured that no one's going to dethrone you as the Hittite King unless somebody grows too large. Now, after that, uh, it's a pretty standard tech tree route. You finish off you finish off the stone, maybe grab the gold if you've got a gold mine. Get more wood, always good. If you meet the Egyptians, they're almost always willing to take wood from you because Egypt's lacking in wood. Uh, so you can get some really good trade deals, especially for food. Getting a god dedication is great. Probably put it on your leader. Your starting god that you have is... decent um there are better gods for leading armies though so it's something to consider getting a secondary god going and instead dedicating your generals to that now over here you've got bronze you're unlikely to get an alliance with the egyptians meaning you don't need the nile ever given because we're not egyptian we're unlikely to get that instead we have access to some other stuff we want to look over here to the bond between brothers. If you can get alliance with another Hittite faction, I recommend the other playable Hittite one if you're going to find somebody. He's not as big of a threat as he seems, and he doesn't hate you that much, so it's viable to get an alliance with him if you do, and you have bronze, plus 15 bronze, it's great. In general though, once you need bronze. Um, so getting additional bronze, more bronze, and even more bronze will help you support your top tier units. So. Over here, get the relations, stop the civil war, and keep yourself in power, as well as get several vassals. I vassalize most of the Hittite factions with no fighting. Uh, wood, gods, more bronze, get your XP per turn on your soldiers, more stone. Potentially build your way through out to stuff like ambushing and sieging. If you're not actually directly fighting battles, this is invaluable. But the reality is you should be able to one-on-one -on -one any faction in the game with the power of your units. Um, it says you're a defensive faction, but the reality is you're an offensive one whose troops just don't die. Um, you will want to get to your higher tier units, in which case the upkeep cop cost will help a lot with um, the lack of bronze. Um, Getting over here, once you start building higher tier units, is invaluable. Honestly, you can almost ignore this top part of both trees, which are more how to develop quickly. You don't really need them, um, but I would mention this uh, XP from battles is really nice as well. Um, as well as the fatigue buildup. Since your units are hard to kill, reduced fatigue buildup is really strong, as well as even more reduced fatigue buildup is great. Uh, Overall, you're really good at defending. Um, all the Hittite factions are decent. Um, but 
I mean, if you look at them, the Hittite Axeman is going to be your main uh, offensive unit once you get uh, bronze. But prior to that, the Hattusan Swordsman is going to be the meat of your armies. They're good. Don't forget these Trump, these uh, tribesmen, though. Um, maintaining some of these low-level units for just food. Um, you can support a larger army early on. Yes, you want a couple swordsmen to fill out your army and actually kill things, but the filling in the rest with just these cheap units is really good. Your veteran Hattusan swordsmen, don't lose them. Even though they co cost bronze, they're really good. I mean, look at that level of armor. 115 versus like 15. They're nigh on unkillable, and once you unlock the special recruitments, as well as gifts from your vassals, it's really easy to build up powerful armies as this guy. I don't know why they say he's such a hard start other than the multiple wars. The way to help with the multiple wars, um, we'll go over buildings now and I'll cover that. So the big things, let's look at one of his special buildings, this militia gathering post, morale for own armies, upkeep for own armies, and melee defense for own armies, built all the way up, really strong. Um, as long as you have an army in a province with one of these, the odds of you losing, even if they have superior units, are slim. And this really helps late game with like the Sea People's invasions. You should have an army supply center pretty much in every capital area, or at least on the borders where you're getting invaded. Outside of that, some of your other specialized ones, um, you have this refugee center building. Now, I think this honestly needs a change. Um, it gives you 20 food. Yes, you're lacking in food, but it's barely worth building this. The biggest benefit is the workforce growth. Throwing this down in one of your settlements early on will allow you to build up your capital region super quickly. But afterwards, it's worth getting rid of. The uh, food upkeep, it, it, it's terrible. That should be like 150 or if they're going to push it that way, give us 450 and just make it broken. Um, it's not that great. Um, it does exist, though. The big thing is these garrison stations, though. Combining them with an army supply center, look at that. That is five more units to garrison, including top tier, siege holdout plus, ammunition up, morale up, happiness and influence up. What more could you want from this building? Um, honestly, turn one, constructing this is not a bad move, but you actually have better options. Um, but at some point, you're going to want to throw this down. Once this is down, Hattusa is extremely unlikely to fall. Um, even just the level one, three more, that's 11 units, additional siege, defense, morale. Very hard for enemies to take your capitals. Even if you have an army of five units in there, it's nigh on untakeable by anybody unless they bring two to three armies. Outside of that, though, you don't have much else that is special. Um, it's worth mentioning, though, you do have access to a bakery. In fact, the better turn one I found is to throw down the bakery. 120 food is nice. Workforce, and hap workforce growth and happiness, even better. Unfortunately, you don't really have access to much else. You do have these livestock fields, which you definitely want to build when you can afford it. However, I would throw down bakery first. Livestock field second, but you may want to delay if you get invaded. This settlement tends to get sacked um, really easily. So options to consider. Don't forget to throw down um, a production building in your capital here for more food. Um, sadly, it's not as productive as if you were living on the Nile, um, but it is still really good since food is your real problem early early game followed by bronze any food that helps I sleep easy for once. with that problem will um, make your life a lot easier don't forget though your royal legal complex the plus two happiness faction wide is really useful as you start to expand more unfortunately and this is something that uh, really really bothers me in this game is your influence, there's the Hittites, which you and the other player faction, playable faction character are. And then there's the Eastern Hittites and the Western Hittites. The Egyptians, by and large, are the Egyptians. Instead, your culture is pretty much just like right here. 
this is a different cultural influence and this is a different cultural influence meaning you need to balance out happiness and influence this will help but a better building surprisingly is hall of records um getting this built up to spread influence once you move outside of your capital area invaluable translators quarters making a beeline for this combined with the other texts can really help stabilize your relations with people so you can control how many wars you're going to fight on. I recommend never going after more than one faction at a time. Obviously, the invading factions can't be controlled, but combining these two for the influence, relations, happiness, and this one for more, I was able to control this area happy wa happiness wise and influence wise. Once you move outside of your capital region, though, you may consider heavily throwing down a new scryer stand in a public square, even over a singing, singing circle, just because the uh, control of influence. If you don't have influence, the production from that region is pathetic. Um, having it higher really helps. Happiness, I found, was less of an issue than influence. Kind of feels similar to Amon Messe, um, where that influence is one of your biggest struggles. In terms of your actual units, you have some very interesting uh, building trees here. You have access to the Kaskin Raiders, which when you get are really good at smashing shield units. But you can survive pretty much just on the main infantry line here uh, that you start with. You start with decent units that only get better as time goes on. These Hittite Axemen are tier 3, and you can build them immediately. Only downside is the bronze upkeep. Fully upgraded, though, once you get to the next level here, you get the Veteran Hutchus and Swordsman, which you start with in your army. Um, this is the bread and butter I found of your main line, um, especially versus Invaders. Although the... Um, oops, sorry. The Axemen here... If you're fighting heavily armored factions, you're going to want these Kaskin Axemen against shields and stuff. So you're going to want bold production lines. The reality, though, is in your capital, you're not going to have space to build all of these. So focus really on resources and maybe upgrade your defense, your offensive buildings. But make some other settlement like this one over here, your main production center. It feels weird to say don't build up a strong military in your capital. But you don't need a strong army to hold your capital because of your garrison buildings. You need a strong army to expand and fend off uh, the sea people more than actually taking on individual uh, Hittite factions. Ambushes are your friend. Thankfully, these rivers here really do control where enemies will approach from. The road crossings are great ambush points. Most factions I found will not go across these rivers they will tend to go around so think in terms of approaches and remember that if you have forts or watchtowers it pretty much stops movement past especially if you can get any um there are some really good show points in this game uh like right here if you build a fort or a watchtower enemies just simply cannot get through that without taking out your defense first I wish you could build your own because right there looks pretty nice. There's a couple places where you can create some great defensive points. It becomes more important. The reason I'm mentioning it is as you expand out of your territory towards narrow mountain passes. Also, can we appreciate that they put time into creating some really cool mountains? Um, it becomes more invaluable. So now we've kind of gone over a lot of the buildings. Standard build up, get a lot of resources, focus on your action strength, avoid the refugee centers pretty much unless you need the growth. Don't forget that you can do happiness and influence through the, um, well, what are they called? The uh, management buildings. And if you're struggling to gather resources, check your influence because you may be lacking it. Let's move on to the legacies. So here we are on turn 70. This is my personal lands here. As you can see, I didn't take out these guys and I've been regretting it ever since. Um, I think that was this campaign. Because as you can see, they've started to pick off 
minor settlements and are becoming a real problem. I'm going to have to kill them off soon after this. I uh, eliminated them. But the more important thing is the diplomatic status. So I have several um, allies. Actually, these are vassals. It says allies, but they're actually vassals here. So as you can see, I've gotten a few vassals. I got some more as time went on. As you can see, people are not particularly opposed to becoming my subjects. Their relations with me are slowly getting better. As I keep the... Uh, oops, I always get that confused. This royal decree with the relations really comes into its own in terms of getting subjects. I'm just kind of showing you a game and how it can go. Especially if you expand up here first. Really eliminating these guys would have been a better move. Now, in terms of legacies, this is the one I recommend, the Benevolent. It's the one recommended for this guy anyway. The other one, you have to have vassals to use and can be useful in terms of developing generals and keeping them happy and stuff. But the reality is this one's just, I think, better. Um, a big benefit here, and I'll just go over it quickly, is you have this gratitude bar, which will improve your courtesy gifts, which will randomly come from your vassals and can be quite substantial, but by and large are average. You have this gratitude with them, which is based to a large degree on your relations. Um, it's not hard to keep them happy. Be aware that your own provincial happiness also comes into gratitude. So you keep your populace happy, which is not that hard. Um, this is a province I conquered reasonably recently. Everywhere else loves me. You get access to these tokens of gratitude. So these have various benefits. Um, the big one here I found was expert builders. Gain one use of instant construction in any settlement. So it costs me basically one bar. But then once I start building a settlement, I can click instant builders. The building is done. Uh, it was very easy to raise up my capital. Now, if you want more equipment and you don't have a lot, I found I had too much. You can gain it here. Getting embedded informants. Um, can be quite nice. You get access to whatever that faction sees for some time. Uh, court attendance, you get an additional court action, which is nice, especially if someone starts to get too, too much legitimacy. Picking on them is nice. Or if you want more requests, remember every time someone gets a court position, you can do a request from them. This combos nicely and tempered by war. Um, it's quite nice. XP from battles goes up. Only useful if you're actually going to fight battles. Otherwise, I kind of just ignored this. Uh, it's not hard to have your army build up to a uh, decent level. As you can see, I've had most of these Hattusan Swordsmen for most of the game. They're rank 4. The ones I started with are rank 6. Additional XP is nice, but not game-changing. Some of my other ones are getting up there in terms of ranks. Do remember though, you do have these special recruitments, especially the Royal Hittite units. If you've got bronze, these are invaluable. This thing is monster. When I use this late game, it's a tier six unit. It's not wrong, uh, really strong. Now, the other thing is vassals and a good reason for keeping the vassals happy and stuff. Um, you get vassals, you can just instantly recruit. If you played Total Warhammer, these would be like your regiments of renown or your vast uh, allies, ones you might get to an outpost. These can be good. Since you're Hittite, most of these are Hittite units, so you kind of already know how good they are. Um, be aware, these Hittite tribesmen units, I thought were absolutely horrendously bad, but they actually do a decent job of what I want them to do, so don't forget they exist. The big benefit is the expendable, meaning my main line of units here, don't route when these die. Sacrificial units. Same thing with these axemen over here. Great to kind of throw out there, have do some damage. These guys are and sadly not expendable, but they do have misc walkers and stuff. And in terms of his titles here, the uh, one you want to throw in at the beginning, and I should have mentioned it, is increased battle loot. But as the game goes on, reduced upkeep of food if you can get to this really good at maintaining a larger army um, early on though this recruitment rank really useful you've got a lot of options let's just put it mildly this guy if you survive the early game probably the strongest or closest to strongest faction in the game 
not best at producing resources, but the ability to have your breakthrough charges cause fear, all amazing units. The Hittites were renowned warriors. Um, the Egyptians feared them on the battlefield and vice versa. So it makes sense if you survive, you become a monster. As you can see, looking at the court, nobody is even close to my legitimacy. And most of it, very few from battles. Mostly sacred land, court plots, monuments, and landmarks. And I haven't even had to try. Like, if we look here, I have not built any uh, uh, monuments or anything. That's just simply from the faction itself. Uh, very strong, very powerful. Uh, over here is... Sorry, I should just do this before I forget. Is the influence. As you can see, we're struggling to maintain influence and culture. It's rather annoying. Um, I've had to build some influence, and even then I'm struggling. So I'm only getting 50% from bronze and gold in this region. Thankfully, it doesn't affect stone. Um, otherwise, it would be nigh on unmanageable. But be aware that if you own this land, there are quite a few invaders that come this way. I don't. I guess they're coming from the Black Sea, but uh, it's really hard to react to them with how fast they can swarm through here. Putting defenses to prevent them from getting further has kept them contained, but I needed an army up there almost full time uh, as the game goes on. And as you can see, we're hovering on collapse. The biggest reason is I haven't expanded further. If I were to play this campaign again, and I did in the other ones, taking out this Frigia, invaluable. Um, if a war starts on multiple fronts, I'll end with this because some people are greatly concerned about it. You're going to want to ambush and you're going to want to peace out. Um, it's not the worst thing to pay people to leave wars. Most factions in the area lack food, even though there are a lot of food settlements. And if they're not lacking in food, they're lacking in stone. Um, so bribing some of your enemies to leave the war and waiting till that happens. So just focus on defense can be very strong. The other lesson I learned from this campaign, which I would change, is I would build these Traveler's Inns. Plus 20 movement on land is amazingly good, especially as a faction that's on defense. Combined with my garrison buildings, my settlements don't fall. And if I built a visitor's quarter, I could race around and reinforce. As you can see, I've stuck a garrison quarter in all these settlements. So these are 15, 12 to 15, or 21 defensive ones. I've reinforced my fort which is always a good move to have more troops on the field. Overall, invading this land is probably one of the hardest areas in the game to invade, so most enemies don't. Um, go down garrison buildings, build up your settlements, reinforce. Don't forget you can replenish faster. Really strong if you defeat one enemy and are weakened. Replenish, race around, defeat another. If you start collapsing, as in all your enemies on all sides are at war with you, just restart the campaign. I'm not kidding. Um, throwing on that axe to give the diplomatic relations, getting the tech. As you can see, I'm not really at war with anybody except for the invaders. So, very easy to maintain happiness in Anatolia uh, among the Hittites. Even the other playable one here... He actually likes me. Um, he's one of the people you could, if you wanted an alliance, get. Now, the issue is, and I will say this in the long run, is Irsu tends to come up this way. I don't know why he goes north. I guess because Bay goes south. But Irsu can cause some problems once he arrives. It can be worth, once he, get, he gets here, actually declaring war on him and pushing him out. Regaining some of the Hittite lands to the south. Um... It doesn't go too far south, but picking him off, preventing him from expanding. If you're struggling to expand in the Hittites because they're all your vassals are happy, Ersu has usually conquered this area. And once you defeat his main army, it falls really fast in my experience. So you can race down here, pick up a lot more land, and then really start dealing with people. The other thing is once you get enough legitimacy, and it takes a while, I'm turn 70 and I'm not there. Getting access to the tier 1 powers, it's mainly the forced annexation power, really helps because there 
or a lot of factions who will get beat down to like one province then asked to be your vassal being able to annex them really helps if you get to level two the uh getting two regions covers most of the hittite factions so then you just simply annex them and become massive uh it was most of my conquest as this guy was done peacefully um just through forced annexation in the long run very fun campaign um food is your biggest issue followed by copper this is the big copper mine or you do what i do and you just trade with uh the people on cyprus for copper because they have a lot of copper and that will be it for this guide hopefully it's helped you it's a bit long but there's a lot of details to know about this guy and if it helped you like comment subscribe let me know your strategy or your feedback on which route worked better for you to expand and i hope to see you guys in another guide or let's play bye for now